Good morning and welcome to the Pier Head. Uh, it's a building which was actually described by one of Cardiff's leading academics as beautiful but bonkers, and I think he's absolutely right. So I'm Rosemary Butler, and I have the great pleasure and privilege of being the presiding officer here at the National Assembly for Wales. And I'm particularly delighted to welcome our guests, Baroness Greenfield and Ellen Rees, as this morning's chair. Welcome, girls. So please feel free to speak in Welsh or English. Both are now official working languages here at the Assembly. Um, headsets are available for those who need an English translation, and um, they're quite. Uh, if you can't work them, I don't say that a man will come and tell you how to do it, but somebody will come and tell you how to use it. I am really delighted to see you here today to celebrate the first of our two events for this year's uh, celebration of an important day in the international cal calendar. Now, as you know, 8th of March, which is tomorrow, is International Women's Day. And this date has been observed since the early 1900s, and thousands of events are held throughout the world to inspire women and celebrate their achievements. Many of you will know that I've spent much of the last year encouraging more women into public life, hosting regional seminars across Wales, and a national conference here at the Assembly. I was inspired by the talent we have here in Wales and encouraged by the actions which are now being brought forward. As mandated by the conference, I wrote to party leaders to encourage them to put measures in place to address the drift in women's elections to the Assembly. You may have seen some of the welcome, and particularly some less welcome, publicity around this. We're also planning how to effectively develop an online network where training, public appointment information and a public forum can be available in one place. We still have some work to do on this, but I am hopeful to make an announcement in the next few months. I was very pleased that the Welsh Government has now set a target of 40% of women into public appointments in Wales. Although this should of course be 40% of men and not 40% of women, but we'll get there eventually. And I am very proud the National Assembly for Wales is celebrated as an exemplar of quality across the UK. We have a female presiding officer, a female chief executive in Claire Clancy, and the director of legal services, Elizabeth Jones. So there's been a lot of activity and publicity about this issue over the last few months, and I hope that publicity will continue, uh, but I'm looking forward to moving on to the next stage. Now, I can see a number of attendees and panel members from our Wales events in the audience today, as well as some new faces, so you're all very welcome. Now, one of our Women in Public Life panel members has kindly agreed to chair today's session, and I should now like to introduce Ellen Rees, who will take over from here and introduce our esteemed, and I'm sure by my private secretary, trendy guest, Ellen. Well, <coughs> Diolch Rosemary, um, Anwyl Gyfeillion, um, mae'n hyfryd cael bod yma. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm dead chuffed to be here uh, today, to have the chance to introduce our speaker this morning at the Peerhead session. But, gan teg i lic yn i ddiolch i Rosemary. Um, Rosemary, I want to grab this opportunity very quickly to thank you for what you've done over the last couple of months in enticing women um, into public life and in forging a discussion, tirelessly, if I may say so. It is a particularly important thing to do, but not everybody puts in as much energy and passion into it as Rosemary has done. So on behalf of the women in Wales, Rosemary, thank you. Now then, our speaker today has achieved many accolades in the world of science. She's also caused controversy She's shoved her head well and truly above the parapet. She said some stuff that's worth listening to, that people don't like to hear, and she is a total inspiration. She will certainly leave a legacy that we should be grateful for because she's achieved something very special for science and for women. Now, our theme today is women in science. Right? Why women are important to science. What are the risks if not enough women take part in science? What are the pitfalls for women in science? And what can we do to entice more and to ensure that women stay working in science? Once upon a time, I was a scientist. I studied biochemistry donkeys years ago and was hell-bent on a career in industry. 
until the point where my big boss and I were discussing the prospects for a promotion that I was going for, which, for which I was quite qualified, I might say, his words were, well, Lillian Vach, um, you'll surely be having children soon. And um, this isn't really a job for a woman, now is it? And besides that, besides that, the other candidate is a new dad and he's got responsibilities to his family. And so perhaps it's best if you don't apply this time. Now, that was actually 30 years ago to this year. I'm, you know, blimey, that's scary how time goes. And it would be illegal for him to say it now, even though he may still think it. Needless to say, I saw the writing on the wall and I left to pursue a career in television where I actually ticked a few boxes because, way, hey, I was a woman who could talk about science. How quaint was that? And also, I could do it in Welsh. So, ka back of the net, I so started my career in broadcasting. So, I first came across um, Baroness Susan Greenfield while watching her um, with a professional interest, presenting a brilliant series on BBC, The Brain Story. There was also a book, which I still have. Um, and I remember the series for several reasons. Here was a woman who was a real scientist at the top of her game, presenting a series about the brain with authority and clarity and authenticity and hadn't give up, hadn't given up at the first sign of sexual discrimination. What's more, she made it also accessible. And I knew how hard that was. She made science sing and it showed to all women that anything is possible and to all men that there is no limit to what women can do. Making science popular is vital but not easy. Bringing more women into science is just as vital and just as challenging. Susan has said it's okay for me to call her Susan because I was grappling, what do I call her, professor or do I call her baroness? But she says Susan, which is great. And Susan's mum was a dancer, her dad was an electrician. She became a British scientist, a writer, a broadcaster, a member of the House of Lords. She specialises in brain physiology and is a professor of pharmacology at Oxford. She has at least 30 honorary degrees. She leads research into neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. She has a peerage, a Faraday medal, a CBE and has many honorary fellowships. She studied and written about that elusive phenomenon consciousness and she wrote the private life of the brain and most recently she's aired her views in er areas where others fear to tread about the impact of modern technology on young minds and written the quest for identity in the 21st century she believes that mind change as she calls it is just as important as climate change to our lives where the new environment of two-dimensional screens can impact on the human mind she is a visionary. She's also sassy. Oh yes, she has her detractors, but she holds her own. She's brave with her views and her ideas and doesn't shy away. She's been called the girl with all the brains. She rates Elizabeth I and would actually wouldn't have minded having her as a mentor. She's down to earth and when I was actually cyber stalking her, sorry, um, I did discover that her guilty pleasure is, yes, eyelash extensions. <laughs> she is well cool, as my daughter said last night. And she actually regrets that she didn't appreciate her two grandmothers more when they were alive. And that is something that I think many of us might share. She's a great role model for women, young and old. And I believe that generations of women and the world of science will appreciate what she has done and will owe her a huge debt of gratitude. Felly roch groeso cynnes Cymreig i'n siaradwr gwaedd. Please give a warm Welsh women's welcome to Baroness Susan Greenfield. Diolch yn fawr. Uh, diolch. Diolch. I'm bori da, but I'm, you're probably relieved to hear that's the only Welsh I know, so um, I'll proceed in English. Thank you very, very much for that very generous introduction. I can't wait to hear myself after all that. <laughs> and um, Madam Presiding Officer, thank you as well for, for giving, uh, giving the time and uh, all your support for something that we think is really important. So the plan is, I'm going to talk for about half an hour, laying out, if you like, the stall as I see it in terms of the issues facing 
women in science and drawing on inevitably some of my own examples. And then we're going to have a chat and a free-for-all question time where hopefully we can uh, range far and wide on, uh, on some of the important things. And the fact there's so many people here on such a rainy morning, I think, testifies to the importance of the subject. OK, so let's have a look then at uh, what's facing us. So as I said, I was going to personalize things. And as you can see, um, this is from the 1950s when I was at kindergarten. Um, and in those days, all the little girls had bows in their hair. Um, they never, ever wore uh, trousers. All the little boys, even, I think, were wearing shorts and possibly ties. And here's me here. That's me um, conforming with everyone else. Now, had anyone said at that time, um, when you grow up, you're going to be a scientist, I would have had no idea what that was or what that meant. I wanted to ride horses. That was my main goal in life. Um, and this notion that one would do science, obviously we didn't do it at that stage at school, and all I knew from science was that there were people in white coats on the television in those days in adverts for washing powder, where you'd have brand X versus Omo or something, and that was what I thought science was. Um, and certainly in my family, as you've heard, they, both my parents left school at 14, and uh, the idea of science or even university would have been something that was on as far away as Mars. Um, so how things have changed or not, as the case may be, and I think what we can do this morning is look at some of the changes, but sadly, um, some of the continuing problems that a little girl born like I was then to that kind of background uh, may still be facing. Okay, so let's look first at the, uh, the myths that we might slip up on, like the banana skin. So myth one is that it's all genetic. Wouldn't it be easy, I could just stand down now, if... Um, women were just not genetically programmed to do science. It wouldn't be easy if we were all Stepford wives um, obeying the dictates of our genes, rather like in this American pageant here. I, actually, I feel sorry for this little girl in the red dress. She looks as though she's been shortchanged compared to the other ones. But, um, uh, but, uh, but you can see the idea here, you know, that uh, this is what little girls are like and this is what you should look like um, very differently. Now, we know that if you look at brain scans, there are differences. And a continuing theme here is that we are not the same as men, but we are not inferior to men, but we can, if we shape the environment appropriately, have a complementarity, the two genders, where we can actually um, do far better than either could do unilaterally. And as you can see, for those of you not familiar with the brain, the right-hand side is the front, the left-hand side is the back, and you're looking sideways on. And very gratifyingly in this particular particular example, which of course I've taken, there's more areas of the brain lighting up in the women than in the men, but you know, that's, <laughs> um, this is because um, we have a bigger motorway between the two hemispheres um, than they do um, on average, and so this is one of the ideas that the, um, we can multitask more readily. But then they do other things that we don't do, like they're good at hunting, they have tunnel vision, literally and metaphorically, for sort of looking into the distance to, to get their quarry, and so on. So we come more to these sort of stereotypes later. But the point I want to make is, yes, there are differences in the brain, but you can't say that just because you're born one way or the other, um, you're going to be a certain type of person, um, along with the obvious uh, crude evolutionary kind of profiles. I'd like to think that ultimately, ultimately, the individual trumps gender, and the individual is what counts, irrespective of what kind of chromosomes they have. Okay, so here's someone who doesn't believe that. This is someone called Larry Summers, um, who actually uh, featured in the last administration in the States, but was famous a while ago. I'm sure you remember this, because in 2005, he came up with this brilliant idea um, that uh, there was an innate difference between men and women, and that was one of the reasons that women didn't succeed in science, because they were not capable of doing that. You can imagine this didn't go down too well. Um, and in fact, I met him at the World Economic Forum, and he was rather as that photo looks, you know, wow. right? <laughs> Without getting too, uh, well, I don't get too slanderous, but um, he was someone um, who did represent the worst sometimes of the male stereotype of the white um, middle-aged man um, who has a certain um, feeling that he's right. Michael Faraday once said, there's nothing quite as frightening as somebody who knows they're right. And you may know people like that yourself. But um, anyway, he was convinced that um, you know, uh, he wasn't going to be persuaded by anything. But I tried to explain, as I shall now, that really you can't have trapped inside DNA a sophisticated mental trait like being good or bad at science. It just doesn't make sense. If you think about how the brain's put together, and this is the only kind of neuroscience slide I'm going to show, and I do apologize because I know it's early in the morning. Um, the way the brain's put together is you start with this wonderful inner 
state that no one else can share, that unless you've fallen asleep already, you're enjoying at the moment, one hopes. Um, when that goes wrong, we can talk about complex syndromes such as schizophrenia or depression. And as some of you may know, that's composed of impairments in a whole range of different types of functions, such as memory or vision or language, which in turn can be divvied up further into subfunctions. So vision, for example, a simple, seemingly simple thing, can actually be divided into color, form, and movement, all of which are shared among the brain regions so that any one brain region um, will participate um, they'll contribute to a function, and at the same time, they'll participate in many different functions. So it's not a one-on-one. -on -one. If you pull the brain regions apart, you get large-scale coalitions of brain cells that we call assemblies. Um, and if you pull it apart further, you get isolated circuits of brain cells. And if you look down and zoom into the working unit of a circuit, you get the gap between one brain cell and another, called a synapse. And if you go further, and look at how the gap between one brain cell and another works to enable communication between the brain cells. You have the release of a chemical that requires a lot of biochemical chicanery in order for it to work in terms of its manufacture, its release, its action, its removal. And all that clever biochemistry um, is finally determined. Those proteins that are necessary are finally um, determined by activation of the genes which finally will indirectly cause their synthesis. So, that, so that's the fastest brain course in the country, I think, that's it. So that's it, that's, I won't go any further. That's the, that's the fastest neuroscience course ever. Um, but the point is, and where I put the, the genes in red, you cannot jump, I hope you'll appreciate, um, ignoring this nested hierarchy. You can't just jump from a gene to a sophisticated mental trait. And I hope that that very brief scamper through the neuroscience of the brain shows you how things are organized. Yes, of course, genes are important if it goes wrong as in the case, sadly, with a condition you may have heard of called Huntington's disease, used to be called Huntington's career. That's a single gene disorder. If something goes wrong, then indirectly there will be a problem. But even with that, we know the environment can make a difference. So um, if you like an analogy between what we've just looked at, um, between genes and final function, I love this Rube Goldberg machine where um, we're going from left to right, and the rain falling is the equivalent of a gene being activated. And what we're looking at is a self-opening umbrella. As its name suggests, um, uh, the umbrella will open automatically when it rains. Um, you don't need your hands, but there is a high price to pay. You have this strapped on you. So let's just go through this, and you'll see it's, it's crudely similar to the, um, the hierarchy we've just looked at in the brain. So rain falls on a prune. OK, here we go. Rain falls on a prune, and the prune... Oh, sorry. Where are we? And the, yeah. So rain falls on a prune. The prune swells and pushes up a lever, and that pushes down an old flint lighter. And that lights a candle that boils water in a kettle. And the steam coming out blows a whistle that scares a monkey. And the monkey, as a result, jumps on the swing. And the swing rocks backwards and forwards. And there's a knife attached to the swing. And so the knife slices through this string anchoring a balloon. So the balloon rises in the air. Oops, sorry. Rises in the air. And as it rises, the string's also tied to cage doors. So they open. And the little birds fly out. And they're attached to the umbrella. So the umbrella opens. Yeah. That's how it is. Now, that's just a very crude analogy to how the genes work. So a lot of things can happen. The monkey might not be scared. The knife might be rusty. The birds might like to be in their home cage. You know, there's not a direct link between the rain falling and the umbrella opening. And yet, um, you can see, or something else might scare the monkey. So, so you can see that although genes are necessary, they're not sufficient for determining final function. And uh, that's an issue when we're trying to think about how genes play a part. I want to say there are crude evolutionary tendencies between men and women, but what we're after, are we not, is that the individual trumps those things or that we use those differences to complement each other. Okay, myth two is that the real leaders in society, and that would include the leaders in science, need to be white middle-aged men. This is Baroness Scotland, who was one of the first women of color uh, to be a judge, um, who is in the House of Lords, whom I know quite well. Um, so here we are. Now, this is me with some colleagues, and as you can see, they are conforming to the stereotype. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're all very nice men, yeah, and so on, but they're, they're white middle-aged men in suits and ties, and I'm afraid that this is the kind of image that especially young girls might perceive when they think of science. They think it's not for them because, on the whole, the scientists seem to be a very specific type of person from a specific um, ethnicity, specific age, um, and certainly all male. Um, I love this one from the far side of how, I mean, apart from the fact it's talking about poor old Webster blowing his cerebral cortex, and that's obviously what happens if you do too much maths, um, you can see here um, how the scientists are portrayed. 
where's the woman scientist there? And again, they're fat middle-aged men, yeah? always dubious sartorial outfits. Now, in return for that, and to show that it's not all doom and gloom, but these are just some green shoots that I think are starting to happen. Uh, this is a wonderful scheme um, developed by a friend of mine some 10 years ago now called Pinky Lilani, and she's pioneered um, recognition for Asian women in all sectors, but including science. And here we have Cherie Blair at one of the award ceremonies wearing a sari or some Eastern thing. But uh, the whole idea is that one is promoting and celebrating um, achievements in sectors that are not traditionally um, where Asian women or women generally might be, might be recognized. We can discuss whether this is a good or bad thing, whether one wants to highlight particular sectors in this way, um, and the fact it might be necessary. But in my own view, I think it is a force for good um, in terms of being role models, again, to, to schoolgirls. Okay, so myth three is female leaders should be viewed differently from men. As you've heard of my um, somewhat, uh, I don't know, stormy relationship with the press, this, imagine you're at Heathrow, as I happen to be, and my office said, you better look in the Daily Mail, and I opened it and saw that. That's me, by the way, when I got divorced 10 years ago. Um, and I just wonder, would a man have that kind of coverage? Um, luckily, it was a miniskirt, but they'd cropped it. That's something, at least, I suppose. But, um, but it was going on about things that were not related to science whatsoever. And somehow, if you are a woman scientist, the relationship with the press is a rather strange one. They'll usually say female scientist. There we are, first female boss. You, know? you wouldn't say female novelist. You wouldn't say female advertising executive. You wouldn't say even female doctor. Or, you know, but you do say female scientists, like it's a, a dog riding a bicycle or something. You know? so it's so odd that uh, that in itself is noteworthy. And moreover, uh, they use words like glamour, they comment on your clothes as though you were a weather girl, and we know that they have problems as well. So I think that's something, again, <coughs> that needs to be discussed. And this myth that um, a woman scientist is different from a man scientist um, prevails. Now, this was from some while ago and it made headline news. And this is the Swedish Medical Research Council. Um, Sweden has a very good record for equality, and yet, even there, they were showing that there was sexism in the peer review for grants. Um, I'm going to show you a graph in a second that really was quite alarming. It was published in Nature. It's completely robust in what it shows, where they looked at an objective score of people's competence, men and women, in science by looking at the impact value of the journals they were publishing in compared to how they were perceived, and this is what they found. So here you can see that a excellent woman here who's scoring very high is perceived to be about as good as a low average man. Amazing. And this isn't just gossip, it's not anecdote, this is a, a, a something published in Nature. You might say, well that was in 1997 and surely things have moved on, that's 16 years ago. Obviously it's all different now um, and such things um, are no longer the case. I would answer back and say, well, prove that to me. And then I would also say, look at this. This was published last year in PNAS, um, where they were looking at um, the attitudes of both men and women in a faculty to recruitment, where they changed the names of the applicants and nothing else from male to female and so on. And as you can see, it shows a, a gender bias, um, where, and this is last year, uh, clearly, for competence, higher ability, and mentoring, the woman scores low in subjective evaluations, even though the name's out. And this is the most galling one. Look at that. Salary. And the scientists among you will realize that's highly significant in terms of the error bars. Um, now, this is last year. So, although that, po that Nature paper was published um, 13 years ago, it's still 16 years ago. You can still, there are still issues here that we need to confront. And these are, this is hard data. This is not just people saying they had a bad time uh, anecdotally. These, these are actually happening. Um, this is the Queen at the Royal Institution where I was. And why aren't we seeing more pictures like this? The Queen interested in science talking to a young, attractive woman scientist. Why aren't we seeing more of that to show schoolgirls that it is something that is exciting to do? Um, and also, another issue I think that people are unaware of, and this is something we could do very easily, is actually let the next generation know that you don't have to be working with necessarily these white-coated, very specific stereotype men, as well as doing research in university or industry, you could start your own company, and if you have a science and technology base, this is what I would have said to the Elaine of long ago, when you were struggling with that prejudice, why not start your own company if you've got some science ideas? Why not go into teaching? And heavens, we do need, especially in the physical sciences, inspirational women teaching science to girls. The media, 
as you can see, as, as Elaine just said, you know, she ticked all the boxes there, the more scientists you have to give dispassionate and accurate recording of increasingly the stories that are touching all our lives that are science-based. How important is that? Politics in the House of Lords, I'm very proud because um, about, I think, 10% have some kind of science credentials, unlike the House of Commons, uh, where they don't. And this does inform amazing debates that we had. I remember a few years ago, we had one on stem cells, um, which anyone reading in Hansard who didn't know what stem cells were would see in this three-hour debate all aspects, whether it's the economics or um, the medical uh, implications or the ethics or the neuroscience applications. Or It was a wonderful, wonderful debate that I'm very proud was because so many of us had something we could bring to the party from some kind of science background. And I'm sure you'll agree that in the House of Commons it would be great if we had a few more um, scientists uh, there informing uh, some of the increasingly important issues. And in the law, it's often fascinated me, the mixture between science and the law, how science is used as evidence, um, and how, as well as uh, looking for I don't know, the gene for criminality or brain scans that might show criminal tendencies and that used as mitigating circumstances, um, as well as that, uh, there's a huge need for patenting and for that combination of a science expertise with a legal one. So why not say this to schoolgirls? that at some stage, if, if they take science that little bit further, they'll have this wonderful choice of very exciting uh, things to do. And then, of course, they can stand up and talk and write and think and actually have a voice at the table, uh, which, if they're not informed, won't be so authoritative as otherwise. So these are the issues. Um, then we come on to, to bottlenecks, because it all seems so good, but what is it that's stopping us achieving that? Well, let's look at the bottlenecks. Um, inevitably, inevitably, there is the balance between having a family and um, a career. Now, in science, this is particularly acute. And in 2002, I authored a report here called Set Fair, um, as you can see with Nancy Lane and uh, Jan Peters um, and uh, so on. Uh, and we authored this report looking at the retention and recruitment of women in science. And although it's now over 10 years old, I have to say some of the problems are still there and we can explore why that's so. The main problem, the main problem is shown on the next slide. Okay, so here we have, um, and things haven't changed that much, the relative ratios of men and women doing the physical sciences from PhD through to professors. And I don't know what's the more depressing, whether it's that, which shows a 90-10 difference, or this for biomedical sciences, where at the early stages, there's pretty much equal numbers of girls doing biomedical sciences. And certainly when I, I um, for 15 years, I was the medical tutor at Lincoln College, Oxford, and I used to interview large numbers of very bright um, and good female candidates for medicine. So what happens, why is it after PhD at the research level stage, and this is mid to late 20s, why do we have this terrible scissor so it ends up the same as the physical sciences? Well, one of the most obvious reasons is that is the chart-bearing years. And one of the big problems for science, and I think people who are not in the science world don't appreciate, is of course at that stage, um, you don't have a career structure. You have a two or three year contract. You're only as good as the work you produce in that contract. And unlike so many others, there's no structure and no security. So when you're at that age, you have a choice. Either you don't have children, as I didn't. I'm happy to talk about why, if you like, later. You don't have children, or you delay having children beyond your biological optimum to your 30s when you might have tenure. Or you give up, have, you have children and don't go to the lab and you come back in a much more junior role because um, you've missed out. Or you try and be superwoman, as I've seen one of my postdocs do, where at five o'clock she had to turn into a pumpkin because that's when the creche closed and if she was even five minutes late she would be fined um, for a late arrival to pick up her child. So these are not happy choices to make and men don't have to make them as much as women do. And I think this is one of the issues that we're seeing here. And if anything was a single problem to face and to think about, it is that. And certainly when we did our report, we suggested that money should be put aside for so-called returner schemes. Now, some of you may be aware of the Daphne Jackson Foundation, which actually gives money for anyone with primary childcare to then come back with ring fence funds for a few years. Surely we should be rolling that out on a national scale. It will cost money, but if we don't do that, um, the loss of all that talent um, is considerable and would more than be cost effective if only we could persuade politicians that this should really be something that is a serious scheme to do. Um, okay, so again, just to show that there are some green shoots, this is when I was at the Royal Institution in combination with L'Oreal, um, we actually had 
£15,000 fellowships. I know that's not a lot, but it was a great help um, for people, for women who had primary childcare and at the same time wanted to promote their careers in science and they could spend the £15,000 on whatever they wish, whether it was childcare or help in the lab or help with someone to go with them to a conference or whatever. Part of that was how we would evaluate them. But it says a lot that we had four a year and we would usually get over 200 applications. So it was just, it made you weep because they were so good, most of them, and they all deserved it. And it was really hard making that choice, but it shows you there is an unmet need there. Um, I would like to also promote L'Oreal because they work with UNESCO, you may be familiar with this, and we are talking globally about science, and science is a global profession, um, for giving awards for women on all five continents, and they have two levels of award. They have the um, really successful top of their game prizes, and they also give prizes for um, rising stars in their 30s. And again, this is fabulous. If you go to the UNESCO headquarters uh, when they do the prize giving, it's really like the Oscars, you know, everyone is there and dressed up and it's huge fun and a real aff affirmation. But why aren't we seeing more of it? Why isn't it covered more in the press? Why aren't um, the government, why aren't the public sector doing more? Why it shouldn't have to be for the private sector to do this? Um, okay, so how can we unblock these bottlenecks? Well, we have to rethink career structure. And I firmly believe that the government should have um, schemes where anyone with primary childcare competes um, like for like. And this, of course, might mean men also would enter if they'd had, if they were widowers or if they'd had um, primary care as a result of a divorce, or whatever. It would be open to them too. But I imagine the majority would be women. Uh, but anyone who um, has not been able to be full tilt publishing in the peer review journals, which is the gold standard of science probity. And if they haven't been able to do that because they've been balancing the demands of childcare, why not have ring fence funds where for two or three years they then have um, a fellowship and they can go to someone's lab and work and they'd be very welcome if they had their own money um, to re-establish their career. I think we really do need to rethink career structure. We need child-friendly policies where you aren't fined if you're five minutes late for a crash. Uh, when I worked at the Collège de France in Paris, it was much easier. It was much more the cultural norm for nannies that didn't charge you um, a fine if you were late, and people there, there was a high, much higher proportion of women in the lab. Returner schemes I've mentioned. Um, and I think those are real issues that we can think through, but they will cost money like most things. Um, then we get on to later in that plot and thinking about older women or women at the top of their career, this midlife crisis. And I think there's lots of issues here um, that actually would account for why we're seeing such a difference. Um, there's often a, an issue of confidence that women won't apply for jobs. Um, and then there's the issue of representation on the interview panels where you need at least a third, apparently, for it um, to be effective. So what are these elephant traps that then would confront someone applying in that way? Well, as I said, the first is confidence. Um, I know that sounds like an easy thing to say, but how many times, perhaps those of you who are scientists here, have you been to meetings, how many times do women stand up and ask questions and then persist politely, but nonetheless, firmly in pursuing a particular line they want to. And Elaine very kindly said, that's what I tend to do. The fact she had to flag that as something that was unusual for a woman, I find rather sad. It doesn't mean to say you have to be aggressive like a man or stick your jaw out and say, I'll tell you this for free and be aggressive like they be. But on the other hand, somehow we need to help women gain more confidence um, against all the cultural upbringings they've had. I love this picture. I think you love this. As a, yeah, yeah. And I think this does say a lot that a woman I know, will go in apologizing for the three out of 10 things that she doesn't have, whereas a man will go in promoting the seven out of 10 things he does have. I'm sorry for the gentleman here that I am talking in. I know stereotypes and the worst possible biases, but I couldn't resist it showing that because I think there is an element there with your tongue in your cheek that that can happen um, all too often. Um, men have different agendas, as I've said, um, and I think one has to recognize that sometimes in a crude evolutionary sweep, but not let that obscure the individual there. For example, they were evolved to hunt, to be aggressive, um, to compete in a way that women were not, and that still plays out. Um, we need to recognize and understand how to develop a complementarity between our old evolutionary roles, finding the right compromise, as opposed to this. You know, shame her enthusiasm and qualification was excellent. She was let down by her attitude towards important bits of paper. They might have different views to us on things. Um, I think... And I'm not saying that women are the entire victims because I think we can help ourselves more. And one of the things that women do is we talk a lot more than men. I think a woman uses three times as many words per day than a man does. 
Um, now, this has both good and bad things. Because we use words and conversation as a bonding to establish relationships in a way perhaps that they don't, it means that not only do we use conversation differently, but we are in danger of conflating personal with professional. Um, these are just some of the differences. This is just a standard thing that you can find on the web. But the point is, and I won't go straight in detail, but the point is that um, it's recognized that language can be used in many ways for many different purposes. And sometimes that can confuse things. So for example, if I'm disciplining a female in my group, I always feel I have to start by saying, look, I like you a lot. And what I'm going to say now is because you know, I really care about how your career is going. And you know, it might be that uh, we need to talk about how hard you've been working recently. And we, you have to do it like that, by prefacing how much you like them, you're trying to help them. Whereas a man, all you have to say is, look, you're not working hard enough. And they just take it on the chin, that's fine, because they, they, they can compartmentalize. Whereas a woman, the whole point about women being good at relationships, good at trying to empathize with each other, the downside of that is that they can often get overly emotional um, in a professional relationship, in that sort of situation. So in which case, what would be the options? Well, you can get angry, in which case you'll then be called neurotic. How many times has a man ever been called neurotic? Um, or you can suppress your feelings, in which case you'll have insomnia and ulcers, and it will corrode you from inside. Or you can find a mentor, and that's what I would suggest. As soon as you can laugh at something, it no longer does you any harm. Um, you remember the, the film by Charlie Chaplin, The Great Dictator, which parodied Hitler during the war? And as soon as you can laugh at it, then somehow the person doesn't frighten you anymore. And I'm not just saying you should laugh at men to their face, although that is an option um, if, you, if you're feeling brave. But you know, uh, incidentally, that does work, but it doesn't win you any friends. But nonetheless, it, it is a way of combating things. But to go off with a woman, have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, if you like, and just, it doesn't even have to be a woman. It can be just someone um, who believes in you. And you can just talk it through and laugh at it. And it puts it all into context. It doesn't redress the justice, of course not. It doesn't make it easy, of course not, but at least you can cope with it and you can handle it in a way that you might not otherwise. So the final trap then is to ignore the importance of finding the right mentor. I love this definition of a mentor as someone who believes in you more than you believe in yourself. And I think we all need mentors. And again, something we can do um, is to try and ensure that women help other women in science rather than pulling away the ladder. And all too often that can happen, I'm afraid. But it can something. Here are my two mentors. Jane Mellonby is my tutor in my Oxford College, St. Hilda's. And she's got a lot to answer for. When I was thrashing around after my first degree, she said, oh, I think it'd be a laugh if you were a scientist. She said, laugh. That's what she actually said. Go and see Professor Payton. And so it was this marvelous sort of insouciant attitude that she had this no-nonsense attitude um, that was hugely supportive, and I'm very, very fond of her. The other is my dearest friend, John Stein, who I've known for 40 years, who's brother of the much more famous Rick Stein, if you recognize the resemblance. Um, but he's, he's a medical tutor at Magdalen College, and I worked with him for a long time. And whenever I get a good result or a bad result, he's the first person I email or phone um, who's always interested. So the reason I'm showing you him is because um, I'd like to show that it wouldn't, wouldn't have to be a woman that has done that, you know, that men, men can make excellent mentors as well. Um, this is Cara, who is the daughter, she was four at the time of this photo, the daughter, uh, when I worked in Australia, of my project manager, Linda. Why am I showing you Cara? Well, at one stage, um, we had this big reception in Australia where everyone was dressed up, and uh, I was wearing a kind of sparkly, sparkly scarf or something like that, or her mother was. Um, anyway, Cara was there, and she heard all these people talking, and... The next day, she's a very bright little girl. She got her mother's sparkly staff and put it round. She said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a girl scientist. And I love this idea of a girl scientist. But what I don't like is the idea that you define a girl scientist by someone who wears a sparkly scarf. Um, so more of a role model are these three. Um, Rosalind Franklin, who, of course, everyone's heard of and knows about. Dorothy Hodgkin. Um, it's a shame there are so few. And my ultimate heroine is Rita Levi-Montalcini here, who perhaps is not as well known as the other two, but the reason she's a great moral model is that um, she uh, was a qualified doctor during Mussolini's um, regime. She was Jewish, so therefore she was banned from practicing medicine. So she set up a laboratory in her own house, and the work she did for that actually laid the foundations for her to win in the 70s the Nobel Prize. She also lived to be 100 and something and was in the Senate in their upper house. So she's, she only died 
uh, earlier this year in January. So a huge role model, fighting prejudices of being Jewish and prejudices of being a woman. And nonetheless, instead of whinging about it or just giving up, actually doing against all the odds, setting up a lab in her home. So it shouldn't have to be like this. But I think stories like that are the kinds of stories we need to get out there for women. Um, it's not easy. Um, and as someone once said, for every complex situation, there's always a simple answer, and it's always wrong. So what we need to do is we need to unpack you know, the issues of get re recruiting schoolgirls. We need to unpack the issues of um, what you do about childcare, the issues of confidence, the issues of developing role models with the media and how to handle that. There's lots of separate questions, and I'm sorry I've just galloped through it there. But the fact that Elaine's on her feet means that we're obviously tight for time, so I'll shut up now and uh, hand over to you and Elaine, and we can perhaps talk through some of these things um, less formally. Thank you very much. That was amazing. And is it too late for me to ask you to be my mentor? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> um, it, there were some things in that talk which, which really hit home. And one of the points that I wanted to raise, um, because it's, I guess it, it's an elephant in the room, is the issue of, of children. Um, I did actually start a company 10 years on from, from what happened to me. Um, and I employ, I've been doing it for 20 years, and I employ 70% of my workforce as women. But I will have to say that there are huge difficulties for, business, for, for SMEs in particular who um, wish to employ women in terms of enabling them to come back to work, not just for their finances, but for the business finances also. And I think we really need to pay attention to what you said, and, and I, I hope the Welsh Assembly is also listening, that businesses need that financial support to get the flexibility. Can I ask you then, please, for the first question, so that people um, get to understand why, why did you not have children? <laughs> okay, well, I have a brother um, who's 13 years younger than me, um, and he says, whenever you talk about me in the press, the only thing you ever say about me is I put you off having babies. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and that was one of the reasons, because um, I learned very early on at the age of 13 that uh, the non-glamorous side of babies, and in those days you had these white toweling nappies and something called Milton, <laughs> which you, know, you soaked these nasty soiled nappies in these buckets, and, you know, that, and then he had this thing called a walkie pen when he was about a year old, which was this evil device with sharp trapezoid sort of metal edges with wheels and he'd get up a head of steam and sort of crash into my knees with this thing anyway on and on I could go um, but certainly that disillusioned me a little bit about the romance and then I'm very happy to say um, when I finally did get married in my 40s my then husband already had a child and he was very clear he didn't want any more and that was fine so it's not but because you felt it was going to hold you back no not at all I didn't wake up one day and say right today I've decided I'm not going to have children mm -hmm. on top of that I was getting so involved in what I was doing I was yeah. so excited it's not that I saw that as a drawback it's just that I was so keen on what I was mm -hmm. doing okay. and I said I didn't get married anyway until I was in my early 40s so all those things meant that you, know, you suddenly realize you're not going to have children. It's not a, a specific decision. But I realized in one sense, um, I, was, I didn't have that agony of and choice. It's made it Unlike some women. Yes, it was yeah. easy for me because I didn't have that agony. I, I, perhaps I didn't have the broodiness that mm -hmm. I know occurs for some, some women. And for them, it is much harder because they really are torn with what to do. So yeah. I can see no. that as an issue. Thank you for answering. No. Right, I'm sure that, oh yes, there are hands already. <laughs> I haven't even invited you yet. Is there a microphone that walking around? Can people hear me on this mic like this? Yeah. yeah. Please, could, could you say who you are, just so that we, uh, so that we I'm from Cardiff Metropolitan, and I'm a psychologist, so I consider myself a scientist with three children. And I'm interested that we're assuming that women do childcare. Obviously, women have babies, and that's great, and raising children is great. So why don't we encourage men to get involved in something that is actually great? And I think that's a problem. There's an assumption that women look after children. Um, I think there's other countries. I don't know if anyone from Scandinavia here, but I think in Scandinavia they have much more generous, or you can choose what parent is having the maternity or paternity leave, and one could think of that kind of legislation. The other issue you'll touch on is something that's very slippery and interesting called cultural change. Now, on the one hand, you say, well, why can't we change the culture, um, which is what you're talking about? And on the one hand, you think, well, how do I do that? Then again, if you think about it, when I was growing up, every lady had a mink coat. That was what you aspired to, yeah? That was the hallmark of everything. Nowadays, I doubt if anyone would dare to go out in the street wearing a mink coat. 
No one has legislated. It's not against the law to wear a mink coat. We haven't had to have legislation. But there has, that's an example, to my mind, of cultural change, which is quite a powerful one. Now, how did that happen? It happened with the media. It happened with the facts. It happened with getting people to be aware of these poor little things being clubbed and so on. But when you think about it, why can't we have similar attempts, rather like with the mink coat business, but for promoting a different way of thinking about families, about women in science, about how men play a role. So I agree with you. But again, it won't happen automatically unless we make it happen, unless we do something, in the media especially. Yeah, this is my fault. Yeah. Hey. I'm Helen White Cooper from Cardiff University. I actually have three children, and I'm also a single mum for most of the week. What I say to my female students is that science is the best possible career for them for having children and being a scientist. Yes, I have to get home at by six o'clock every night, otherwise they'll call social services because I haven't yeah. clicked up my son. But I get myself home by six o'clock every night. I can take my work home with me. I can set my own agenda and do what I want, when I want. And I can't think of another job I could do that in. So I think perhaps we should change our tune and say, this is the job that we should do, not, oh, you've got to manage the children. Uh. Yeah, I think there's two issues you've touched on there. And I often say this to non-scientists. I say, look, science isn't just a job. It's not like, dare I say it, being a doctor or a dentist. Uh, or, you know, it's not doing a job that someone else could take over from you very simply because no two scientists will interpret data in the same way, devise the same experiment. And of course, although the methodology is uniform, the way you deal with it, what your priorities are, the questions you ask, are very much yours, which means that your science is, I think the analogy is more like writing a novel or a symphony. It's something that's hugely creative. And I agree with you. I think if one could get that message across to people, that would be really powerful. That said, although as you're more senior, you can write papers at home and, and do literature searches, at the end of the day, at a junior level, you can't delegate the bench work. And you know, when you're in your 20s, whereas I can sit at home and I know they're all, let's hope even now as we're speaking, they're in the lab, uh, you know, <laughs> let's hope, uh, instead of having coffee, let's hope they're there. Um, but when you're more junior, you have to do your own experiments, you have to make up your own solutions. And if you're not there to do that, then your competitors will be doing it and moving on. So I think that on the one hand, I really endorse what you say. The more we could get across this notion that doing science is really creative in a way that um, doing a professional job is not. And that's so exciting. But we do need to think of ways in which we can help people who've got demands on their time to nonetheless have the ability to get into the lab somehow and be paid for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Am I okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Melissa Warren. I'm a textile artist and designer representing the Makers Guild in Wales over the road and Craft in the Bay. And I just wanted to say that within the arts and applied arts community, I think we do this much more naturally as husbands and wives and partners that we actually do share the upbringing of the child. So it comes more naturally. A way around this, I, I, I think it would be a fantastic scenario. So now we're all in agreement. How do we get the cultural shift? Okay, here's a suggestion to you. Right? Why not have the everyday story of simple lab folk? You know, don't, 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 this is a sort of soap opera of research scientists. Yeah, because no, the, the Archers yeah, was see. developed in the late forties. No, it was to make farm. No, to talk about agriculture. Mm -hmm. So I understand it after the Second World War and to enhance farming practices and best practice in agriculture when the country needed it. Yeah. So it was a very cynical divide. You know, to get. We all know we love stories. We learn from stories. We identify with stories. Where are the stories? Where's the soap opera about a woman scientist in a lab? Well, you know, and all the issues and so on. And that is how you get things. I, th I think you hit the nail on the head. And if there's been anything in the last twenty years of my career is trying to persuade broadcasters. Um, hmm. to make science programs because people do not watch them yeah. you know because because there is this kind of fear that they're not going to understand it and there's the lack of confidence issue that you were talking yeah. about so um, and, and you you were one of the first people to popularize science yeah. yeah i think there's two ways of popularizing science there's a way that i did it and dare i say browns cox which is you tell someone something exciting in easy to understand yeah. terms about something or you have an idea, yeah, like dog, yes, and so you can have an idea that happens to draw on science or need science. Okay, and should I think, we do that then? I think we should do that. Okay. But I think also the soap opera idea. I mean, I know it sounds trivial, but it's not because that is how you get to people. 
mm. as, as everyone knows yeah. about propaganda, by telling stories. You know? And I think the more stories you can tell, like this lady said, but you, know, you could have two women, an arts one and a science one, the arts one with the nice husband doing the things, <laughs> and the other trying to get the husband to stay okay. at home with the kids. You know? <laughs> I, mean, I can see it now, the script the I'm following. Go, yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, OK, if you pass it over there, and then Rosie, and then there's yeah. a lady at the back afterwards. Okay. Um, you'll be delighted to know that Alice Archer is um, <laughs> a scientific engineer and there's a big storyline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. One is not enough. Mm. <laughs> Rosie Plummer, Director of the National Botanic Garden. Yes, I am a real scientist turned kind of gone to the dark side of management. Um, Athena Swan has been a, a massively motivating force. In fact, the Royal Society was behind it. Was, was a huge change. And in Wales, we've done a, a, a range of things with this, Athena and women in universities mentoring schemes, for example. So promoting mentoring across, um, as has um, Janet Gamer in, uh, for public life uh, uh, appointments. Um, there, there are sort of motivations in terms of science and the research councils, for example, that have been very effective, like the putting in the public communication of science motivation. What can we do? What's the next stage that we can do to encourage the funding bodies to say, and what are you doing to enable female scientists or, or to raise that? You know, what's the one thing you would suggest that we could try to get them to do that might help? <laughs> yeah, okay. The first thing is the most obvious thing is money, of course. You know, you, can't, you can do very little um, with money. You can do so much more if you have budget. So after my report, when I suggested about the returner scheme, um, they set up at Sheffield Hallam University um, a centre for women in science, but the money they allocated for a returner scheme was like a million pounds, or, or one or two million pounds. Now, just very crudely, a salary with overheads is about 50,000 pounds, consumables you need about, so say you need between 50 and 100,000 pounds per year per woman. You can see that for two or three years, your million pounds isn't going to go very far in terms of the fellowships. It has to be rolling money and so on. So, we really do need a much more serious approach to the government or a way of promoting this with the government you know, to actually um, to do that. Now, the other issue, which is a, a slightly darker side, is the attitude of other scientists um, in that we can set up as many schemes as you like, but going back to the cultural issue, <coughs> cultural shifts, there is within the science community, and I can speak as a victim of this directly, a certain snobbery and prejudice and fear um, of... Uh, my colleagues, who that you're going to be dumbing down. Now, let's just analyse that, because if you are a scientist, you've worked all your life on a very specific problem or a specific technique, you know more about it than probably anyone else in the country or even arguably the world, or there's just a handful of you. This is how you define yourself. This is your identity. This is what you talk about. This is what you know about really, really well. Then someone comes along who describes it in five minutes or dismisses it in five minutes. How are you going to feel about that person? Yeah, and you think you have to, have to think you have to think this through, yeah, because one has to be a little bit more sympathetic, and we need to square that circle, that you don't want to rob people of their pride, their identity, their speciality by saying, oh, it's all easy, we can explain it all, and it's all easy to do. You have to be sensitive to that and think of how one can, I say, get around that. But I think that counts for partly why many scientists, mainstream scientists, will regard with suspicion people that seem to court the media. And I think, that I say, it's not an easy answer, but it is a problem because if that is the driver within the universities, within research communities, that if you do that, if you put your head above the parapet, then people are going to start regarding with suspicion. Clearly, we're not going to have many people doing it. Yeah. Okay. There's a microphone. There's a lady at the back who's been trying hard. And, and what, uh, hang on a sec. Could I have the lady at the back? Because she's been trying very hard. But while, while, she, while you're walking, can I, can I just ask then... But you have kind of courted controversy, right? Do, well, you've it's, you've created it. <laughs> so, do you think that that has that has made it bet more easier for you to gain prominence in your career, whereas a man can achieve prominence and be invisible almost? Well, it depends how you define prominence. If it's on the number of peer-reviewed papers I have, then I would like to think the controversy that I called in public life is neither here nor there because a, a referee has to give reasons they're rejecting yeah. your paper or not and you have to reply. So, you know, and I've done no more, no less than, than the average scientist for my, for my age, you know, so I don't think in particular. Um, but certainly, um, you don't court controversy, but I think at the end of the day, you have to stand up and say what you believe in, you mm -hmm. know, and I think that that you know, accounts for every sector 
that sometimes you have to look yourself in the mirror and say, well, look, am I going to just go with the flow? Or if I see some injustice or something that I find important, am I going to stand up? And yes, I do. You know, I do that unashamedly, and I don't mind. But have you been treated differently because, yeah, because well, you're a woman yeah, than I don't, if you'd been a man doing it? It's like, I think so, because on the one hand, let's take, without getting into the great details, um, my concerns about the cyber culture on the brain. Yeah? Now, obviously, people can um, confront me with genuine scientific reasons, and I will listen to those, and if I'm wrong, I'll put my hand up and admit that, and I will come back with evidence that they, and so on, and that's what science is. Any scientist in the room, any scientist will know that there will always be people that will disagree with you, and always that you have you know, discussions. That's what science is, that's how it progresses, and that's what you have to do. The difference is, and perhaps because I'm a woman, is that often it gets flated, conflated with personal issues. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I don't like when people are rude, yeah, or discourteous or wrong. Like even one of my own female colleagues in my own university at one stage went on a blog without even telling me first, saying that I said that autism was linked to screen culture, which I hadn't actually said that, but then launching into career advice for me, you know. And, so, you know, and, I, and, I, and I thought, you know, I shouldn't be doing this in the media and so on. And I thought, well, who asked her? Mm. Yeah, what's it? So, <laughs> so whilst... So, criticism in science is justified, valid, you take it on the chin and you admit if you're wrong and at the end of the day the data decides. What I don't like, and this I think is harder for women and certainly has been for me, is when people get personal yeah. or they feel threatened by you so they're overly hostile because we were discussing earlier, people are often hostile um, when they feel threatened. If I said the earth was flat, people would feel rather sorry for me. I don't think anyone would get angry. But when they feel undermined or threatened or insecure, that's when the defences come up. So I think that there is an element of that, yeah. Thank you. Mm. Sorry, the lady at the back. Oh, no. um, I can relate to many of, the many of the challenges that you've been talking about, about women in professions uh, today. But I'm, I see as a mother of a 16-year-old daughter at the moment making choices into what subject she should choose, which is predetermined the the avenue of her further career and even though she has the ability in sciences and has an interest her perception of science is i don't want to be a doctor so this perception and how do we encourage people to go into medicine or not into medicine but into science because in schools i find there is no um, objectivity there's no insight to be able to encourage children to look wider. At why should I? Why should I persist in, in chemistry? Why should I persist in in the pure sciences instead of encouraging them to go off into doing other areas, particularly girls? Oh, you're really good at English. You're really good at history. Instead of encouraging that science, but I think most of it, even at open days, um, looking at. What is their opportunities? The career insight is very, very narrow. Okay. And I think until we need to encourage, what do you recommend then would happen in schools? Because clearly there needs a change at that inset That's when they're making question. these decisions. That's a good question. There's one that I can answer from personal experience, actually, because um, it's something that I am aware of, now, as well as showing the different career potentials. There, um, I myself hated science at school. I didn't do science at school. Yeah, so I, I can speak from experience. I, I identify with your daughter yes, completely. I did Latin and Greek and ancient history and maths for A-level. So I think I was the only, only tutor in medicine at Oxford with no chemistry O-level, probably. Yeah. So, so I, I fully identify with the mentality of schoolgirls. Now, why didn't I like science? I can't speak for your daughters. Because no one told me in chemistry when we were dabbling with it at 11 why distilling water was interesting. That's what we had to do, distill mm -hmm. water. And I remember we, we traced the circuitry. And no one, I didn't even know what distilled water was used for. You know, no one bothered explaining why you'd want to do this, you know? And then in biology, the amoeba, particularly unexciting life story, you know? You have a circle, and then you draw a kind of egg timer, and then you draw two circles, right? And that's it for the amoeba's reproductive cycle. Yeah? And again, this seemed to me so mundane, so pedestrian, so unimaginative compared to Greek literature and philosophy and discussing why wars started and why people fell in love and what made you the individual you were. It was no contest, obviously. Obviously, that's why I did literature and history, because it was so exciting. So I think the first issue with teaching science, especially to girls, is you have to show the relevance of it. You have to relate it to real life. Now, the physical sciences in particular deal with the very big, the very small, the very fast, or the very slow, beyond the normal um, biological sort of time frames and space frames. So I think if you're going to teach, especially girls who are so into relationships and, and asking questions like that, 
um, science, you have to somehow relate it to real life or use metaphors, you know, which is why I think, and one of the things I would recommend, is teaching the brain in schools. It's mm. considered too difficult, but it gives you insights into those kinds of questions, which is why I took to it like a duck to water, having done Greek philosophy, you know, because it's the same questions, but you're just... And you can, because I've done this, you can explain it even to... Um, primary school children at one level. Mm. You know, so I would like to revolutionise <laughs> you know, science by stealth, but teach people mm. about the brain. It's not too hard. The other thing is about assertiveness, and I feel I have the T-shirt on this because, as Elaine's saying, you know, I put my head above the parapet and I get my fair share of flack. And, and, of course, it's not nice to be attacked, and many women, as I know to my cost and myself, you know, will crumple if someone shouts at them or attacks them. I think because I had a mum who was on the stage and um, you know, had gone through the war and done touring and things, and she was quite toughened to things. Her, her advice was always to laugh at people if they, mm -hmm. if they attack you, because then that disarms them. There's nothing worse. Someone thinks they're being aggressive and you just laugh at them. You know, you're disarming them. So that, incidentally, is a thing. But in terms of being... There's no being assertive and being rude, and I would never be rude to people. and never lose your temper. If you lose your temper, you're out of control. You're not impressing people. It shows you're out of control. And if someone else loses their temper, then you know that that's actually a victory for you if they do that. As, oh. Would you like to say one final word in conclusion for your visit here to Wales? Well, I think the fact that so many people are here on this rainy weekday morning testifies to the importance of how we view the subject. It's not an easy subject. I think it goes from the issues of schoolgirls and recruiting schoolgirls to the issues of dealing with childcare and families to the issues of giving women the confidence to apply for the top jobs and to have equal representation in the evaluation of them when they're applying, just to name three things. I think that certainly the media could play an important part, actually, in promoting, uh, getting into people's awareness, because that's how you create change, mm. like with the mink coats. It's just to create mm. the groundswell of opinion, because politicians will always follow public demand, because otherwise they won't be in power for much longer. So they will always follow what they feel people want mm -hmm. to hear, as, as they should, they're elected representatives. So I don't think it's down for the politicians to top down change everything. It's up to us to do something, as that, as that lady said. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much for coming, thank everyone. You. It's been a great yes. pleasure. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Cynulliad Cenedlaethol Cymru yw'r corff sy'n cael ei ethol yn ddemocrataidd i gynrychioli buddiannau Cymru a'i phobl, i ddeddfu ar gyfer Cymru ac i ddwyn Llywodraeth Cymru i gyfrif. I gael rhagor y wybodaeth ac i ganfod pwy sydd yn eich cynrychioli, ewch i cynulliadcymru.org Neu gallwch chi'n dilyn ar Facebook a Twitter. The National Assembly for Wales is the democratically elected body that represents the interests of Wales and its people, makes laws for Wales and holds the Welsh Government to account. For more information and to find out who represents you, go to assemblywales.org or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.